the first 14 verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, happy birthday, everybody. You look pretty good for 40. <laughs> Did you see in the slides up there that there was an addition in 1958 to Epworth? I was an addition to Epworth in 1958 as well. <laughs> that was the year I was born in Epworth United Methodist Church. Then Epworth Methodist Church was the first church I ever entered as an infant. It's where I was baptized. So we're here to celebrate today just all over the place. We're celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, not just me, but this really is about Christ. And maybe you're a little confused about the lessons. We have some preachers with us this morning who are probably thinking, but you just read the gospel lesson for the first Sunday of Christmas or the first Christmas morning service that we have. We've gone off the lectionary, kind of because I'm old. I've preached it 12 times already. And it leaves out a lot of good passages. But we rearranged passages this year because we focused on the characters in the Christmas story. The first Sunday, we talked about Mary. And what did the angel say to her when the angel showed up? Oh, you've been paying attention. <laughs> then the next Sunday, after Mary gets this ridiculous story, you're going to conceive and bear a child, and he's going to be the son of God. And she says, let it happen to me as you have said. Then Joseph, who has a different kind of experience, he's sleeping. And the angel comes to him. And again, what do angels always say? You really have been paying attention. I'm so proud of you. Then last week, we read the birth of Jesus, which really got everybody confused, because we did that on the third Sunday of Advent. And the shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And suddenly, who came? You can all go like this if you'd like, just like the kids did. And what did the angel say? Not be afraid. OK, and this morning we read John. And John doesn't say anything about being afraid. Well, he does in the epistle, in the letters of John, but not in the gospel. But I do believe that the message, do not be afraid, is being spoken today, not just by me standing here, but in all of our hearts. And we are the recipients of that message. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Epworth. Do not be afraid. United Methodist Church, do not be afraid, people of God and Jesus Christ around the planet. Do not be afraid, because God is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. So what will we become? We don't know, do we? When my parents carried me into that stone church on Cockeysville Road in 1958, trust me, they had no idea what was going to happen to me. I remember saying to my parents, God is calling me to be a pastor. And my mother said, oh, no. <laughs> people are mean to pastors. And she was right. <laughs> Man, people can be mean to a pastor. But they were there when I was ordained. And my grandmother was there when I was ordained. My grandmother's here with me this morning. And every time I share communion, because we are together, Christmas has a way of messing with time and space. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever taken a bite of a cookie, and suddenly you're seven years old, and you're with your grandmother at her kitchen table? Or you see Charlie Brown's Christmas, and suddenly you're in the second grade again? 
and you remember seeing it for the first time. Christmas can take us to the past, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in not so good ways, but Christmas takes us to the future. Advent is not about a baby shower for Mary. That's not what we've been preparing for. We're not preparing a layette. We're not preparing to welcome a baby. We are proclaiming that Christ who was and is, is to come. That's why I picked the lesson I did today from John's epistle. What we shall be has not yet been revealed, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Do you know when I say those words every single time? Do you know what that's part of? It's part of the funeral liturgy for the United Methodist Church. We don't know what's going to happen, do we? We cannot control the future, but we know who holds the future in his hands. It's Jesus Christ who was, who is, who is to come. We can't lose sight of that, folks. There's a lot out there that's scary in the world. And people say when they come to Christmas and they have this yearning for a simpler time, tell me how simpler the times were then, because they really weren't. Were they? Childhood memories with Christmas and cookies and lights and things like that are beautiful and wonderful, but do not ever believe that those times were without pain or want or poverty or coldness. And if you think that was rough, look at the life of Jesus, the times that people lived, the shepherds in the field, cold and hungry and looked down upon. We've never lived in a world that was just all roses and wonder and starlight and Christmas trees. But we have always lived in a world with God, and we will always live in a world with God. And no matter what happens to the United Methodist Church, no matter what happens to any of us here, this congregation will continue to be in ministry into the future. I want us to stop for a moment. Think about the people who got us here today. Some of them are here today. Reverend Bob Hurley is here today. How many of you remember Reverend Bob Hurley? He knew me when my hair was really this color. <laughs> Bill Brown is here today. I knew him when he had hair. <laughs> When I met Bill, he was 19 years old. He's only 22 now, right? And I looked at Tori today, and I was the first probably of 100 people who were going to say to her, I remember you when you were just this big. And Mary Palmer is here today. Where is she? Oh, she's way in the back. We're going to let her talk in a few minutes, so I'm going to preach a short sermon who I was blessed to meet when we went Christmas caroling last week and who told me that being here was the best part of her life. The best 30 years of her life were spent here with you. But I want you to take a moment. I want you to call out the names of the, the saints who maybe are no longer with us who got us here today. Who are the people that you remember when you think of Epworth Church? I think of my Aunt Bertie Myers, who loved the thrifty penny. <laughs> who are your saints? Remember them. Call their names out right now. Hmm? Ed Fischel? Paul Lehman? Bill Gerber? Dave Sartorio? Yell them out, folks. Yell them out. So many saints who have made this congregation what it is today. We are here today because somebody heard the story of God becoming flesh in Jesus Christ, took it to heart. It changed their lives, and so they had to tell. They had to tell. They had to tell. They had no choice but to tell. They were like the shepherds running from the manger. Joy in what they had seen and heard and believed and embraced, what they had to share. You are here because somebody either loved you enough to tell you the good news of Jesus Christ or because you were like me and you had parents who dragged your screaming carcass into the church and put it in a pew. People ask me how I learned so many hymns. My mother sang hymns to me 
and she rocked me at night, but I joined the choir at 10 years old. You know why I joined the choir at 10 years old? Because she couldn't reach me in the choir. <laughs> because believe it or not, sometimes I would act up a little, a little bit sometimes, and she'd plunk me in the head. Don't believe it if she says she didn't. But I could be in the choir going, Mom, can I get me up here? And in that, something took. Something took root in my heart because my parents loved me enough to make me get up and go to church on Sunday morning. I am a great advocate of drag your kid to church because when you're 21 years old and no one's ever told you the good news of Jesus Christ, you're not going to spontaneously wake up and say, let me go get dressed up and go to a place where they sing things I don't know and say prayers I don't understand and I have to get up and sit down at the right time and I have to watch the bullet. I, I, uh, nobody's going to do that but they will if you invite them and you sit with them and you help them. That's why we have the Blue Christmas service because there are people who are very sad at the holidays for a lot of reasons. You may be the person who is the first person to tell them the story in a way they can hear it and a way that it can change their hearts and calm their troubled spirits. You may be the angel. Let me see it who brings the good news to someone for the first time. My prayer for each of us here, for you and me, is that when we hear the story just a couple nights from now, when we hear it again, that we hear it as if for the first time, that we hear it in a way that transforms our souls, sets us on fire with the light of that star so that we can continue to take the message of Jesus Christ in 2020 to a hard hearted and hurting world because there are people who don't want to know the truth and there are people who have never heard it in a way that was given in love. You have it in abundance. So what are we going to be? We don't know. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Don't wait for Christ to return. Don't wait for Easter because Christmas and Easter go hand in hand because the one who was born as the babe in Bethlehem grew to be our savior. He is Emmanuel, God with us always. And he is a wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Of his kingdom, there will be what? No end. Of his kingdom, there will be? No end. Let it live in you and through you so that others might come to find what has saved you and made you whole. In the name of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.